Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Twin. I am the Associate Director here at Community Health Resource Center. Um, before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about our organization here in San Francisco. Again, this is Community Health Resource Center. We're a nonprofit and we've been around for nearly 40 years and we were established by doctors at California Pacific Medical Center to provide resources and care that would supplement their work with patients. Today, we provide four main areas of service, social work services, nutrition counseling, health screenings, and health education. Uh, today's event will see a, a culmination of two of our areas of service, nutrition and health education. Um, you will be hearing from one of our providers uh, on the nutrition team, Elena Zidaru. Elena is a registered dietitian and the director of our nutrition team. She is passionate about working in the outpatient setting and supporting her clients achieve their health goals. She provides individualized nutrition counseling for weight loss and disease prevention, but also provides nutrition therapy for people with various medical conditions such as cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, gastrointestinal disorders, cystic fibrosis, and more. Elena also provides nutrition therapy for cancer patients going through chemotherapy at the Brian Hemming Cancer Care Center or radiation treatment at the CPMC Radonc department on an as-needed basis. Uh, her goal is to meet her clients where they are at in terms of readiness to change and help them set goals that are realistic and achievable to promote self-efficacy and achieving health behavior change. Um, so welcome everybody again. It's a pleasure being with you and thank you for making the time to join us today to um, talk a little bit about uh, kidney disease and some of the things that lead up to kidney disease. And before that, I want to take a, a few moments, much like uh, Twin just did, to talk a little bit about uh, our organization as, as well as our, our sponsor for today, which is Horizon Therapeuticals. Uh, but again, you know, I want to thank every one of you and, and the team per se, and putting, for putting these a wonderful series uh, uh, of educational presentations for all of you. And hopefully uh, after this one, you'll be able to invite other family members or other individuals that you know that may be interested in the, the, that the information can uh, support and help them in their uh, improvement or sustainment of their current uh, health. So thank you very much. Okay, so we went over the initial um, slide here uh, talking about um, our collaboration, which is wonderful. Uh, and we want to continue to do that in our programmings across the board. Uh, and again, want to thank uh, our collaborators for today, uh, Community Health Resources San Francisco, our sponsor Horizon, and most important, all of you that are here today, making the time to listen to this wonderful information uh, that we have for you today. Again, Horizon has been with us for uh, many um, programming opportunities to educate our communities. And this is no different from the support and collaborations that we have with them. And these are some of the uh, resources that we want you to hopefully uh, pick uh, and stay with, your, uh, with, you, with you in mind uh, and in spirit as well, because there are wonderful resources, not only um, across the board in terms of the different areas and, and things that you, know, you may be dealing with with uh, kidney disease, but can also complement some of the resources that Twin just mentioned with um, uh, her organization. So please uh, give those uh, uh, a click uh, when you're online and check them out. Uh, then we have, I think the most important for me personally, uh, I think I found a lot of value in a lot of our community uh, on online communities, and we have different uh, groups that uh, you can chat with individuals and, uh, and uh, uh, groups with specific topics such as di uh, dialysis, uh, transplantation, uh, organ donation, uh, and, and all wonderful conversations and information that is shared in those online communities. So uh, once again, make a, a point to look those up if you haven't already. And then lastly, just want to mention a couple of the activities and events that we have coming up uh, beginning uh, September, October, uh, and towards the, the latter parts of, of this year, uh, our wonderful Authors Luncheon. And I hope that some of you have been able to, over the course of years, uh, participated in this wonderful event where you meet some authors around uh, different uh, book topics, uh, and it's all for, you know, uh, towards uh, helping uh, alleviate some of the kidney disease issues that we deal with. Also, if you have some spare time, I know all of us are busy, but if you want, are wanting to uh, support us in any way, 
uh, please be a volunteer as well as with the, the center. Uh, you know, um, they can always use volunteers as well. And then obviously, uh, can you always use the support for advocacy and trying to move forward a lot of the legislation, not only at the federal level, but also locally, statewide. So, uh, and in California, as we know, it's very important to move a lot of the, the things that uh, can help uh, kidney patients, kidney families, because it affects us directly. And it's actually a little bit uh, more impactful because the federal uh, is kind of a more, not to say it's diluted, but uh, all the California advocacy is really, uh, you know, impacting us uh, directly and a little bit sooner in most cases. So uh, with that, I think that those are the end of uh, our little pieces of information. But again, uh, always feel free to go to uh, kidney.org for any information that you may need uh, and any resources that may be helpful to um, uh, for your information needs for uh, learning uh, and other things. So thank you very much. And, and thank you again for uh, making the time for being with us tonight. So this is week one. Um, we are going to focus more on role of kidneys, um, what they are, how they work, uh, stages of chronic kidney disease, signs and symptoms, some more the medical background around the disease. Um, I truly believe as a dietitian that somebody that has a chronic disease, they are actually going to be able to manage it better if they understand it very well. Week two, so it's a little bit, um, not necessarily boring, but it's not gonna be much nutrition this week. And next week on the 17th, we're gonna look at the nutrition therapy for CKD, um, more nutrition considerations for chronic kidney disease. And week three will be on the 24th, which will focus more on hands-on meal planning, examples of meals, kind of like what you learned in week two, um, that nutrition therapy, how do you put it into practice? How do you put it into uh, meals and snacks um, every day? And then on that week three, I usually share that presentation with another speaker. Um, I think this, um, this year we're going to have a nephrologist talking about his experience with plant-based diets and how that can slow uh, chronic kidney disease. Might have a patient of his um, in his practice that will will share um, his experience. Um, so more to come week three. And um, I love that last kind of class because it's more hands-on and it's more engaging and interactive. Um, so we're gonna go ahead. Can everybody uh, see my screen? Yes, I can yes. see your screen. Okay. Perfect. Um, so um, trying to move the slides and it doesn't work, um, but maybe it's a little bit of a delay trying. Yeah, that might be it, because it worked earlier just fine, but there was a lag. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes. There we are. And here we are. Um, so the agenda for today, as I said, week one, it's all about the role of kidneys. So we have information about basic kidney function, the difference between acute, chronic, acute and chronic kidney disease, stages of chronic kidney disease, risk factors, healthy diet recommendation overview. Again, we're not going to go in a lot of details today, but just a little bit of overview and complications, complications of CKD that can exist. Um, so we're going to start with um, how do kidneys work. And first of all, what they are, there are two, um, are a pair of bean-shaped organs. They're kind of the size of your fist located below your rib cage. Um, and kind of more in the back. And they have a very powerful, um, I mean, they're very important in terms of what they're gonna do in our bodies and you're gonna see that, but they filter about somewhere between 120 to 150 quarts of blood a day. And they produce about one to two quarts of urine. So when you think about starting on 120 to 150, can be up to 200 actually quarts of blood and you get waste material just over one or two quarts of urine. So you can imagine the capacity of filtration so um, that the kidneys have. So it's very important for them to work properly and filter everything well. And we have here a picture. So the blood um, enters the kidneys through the, the red uh, renal artery. And then it just goes in, within each kidney, we have about a million to 1.3 um, million um, nephrons, which are small kind of cells. And each, they have this glomerulus, which um, it's like a very, I think of it as a very dense sieve. 
has an amazing ability of filtration. So the blood goes through all those nephrons, one to 1.2 million each kidney. And then the blood is filtered through the glomerulus. Um, and then the waste is removed at this yellow. So that's the urine. Um, and um, I have here another picture that shows you, you see this is the glomerulus, the filtration, the very tiny capillary, small blood vessels that are helping with the filtration. And then the urine actually gets moved through the two bowls um, and then collected here. And the ureter will move the urine and I'll go back here, we'll move it into the bladder. So that's the storage place of the urine until our body is getting, to uh, is getting ready to eliminate that. So um, whatever is not uh, turned into waste material and excreted through urine uh, will be returned. All that um, filtered blood will return to the body through this um, blue renal art, um, renal vein. Sorry. So go back to the heart and kind of get that cycle started again. So a lot of things are recycled back into the blood and only the waste material will, uh, will get out of the body. So this is, in short, I have here another, I'll say it one more time, I think it was easier to kind of hear it as you're looking at the picture. So blood, blood is pumped by heart via the renal artery to the kidneys. Kidneys remove waste and water from the blood and form urine. The urine moves from kidneys to the bladder by ureters, and then filter blood is returned to the body through the renal vein and urine is eliminated. Now, so this is what happens on a regular basis. Every minute, the kidneys are doing this filtration. Um, the role of the kidneys, uh, of course, it keeps the blood composition stable for our body to function properly, it keeps the state of homeostasis, um, they keep the balance of, of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, phosphate. Um, those electrolytes are important to um, keep the fluid in the right places in our body. Uh, the kidneys also make some hormones, and um, some of them actually they're involved in blood pressure regulation, like renin is one of them, and some are involved actually in red blood cell production, like uh, erythropoietin. Then also another big role of the kidneys is to activate vitamin D and that will help actually maintaining um, a good balance of calcium and um, so kind of adequate vitamin D in the body helps absorb that um, calcium, calcium in our intestines. And that, that's important because that will keep our bones from breaking down um, calcium. So um, it's very important in bone health. And we're gonna see some of the complications of CKD that pertain to bone health. Um, we have two kinds of kidney diseases. I mean, just mainly, we have the acute kidney disease that um, basically um, can be reversible. So it looks like your kidneys are failure. Usually it's, there's something, um, that it can be a medication, a substance, something that kind of triggered that and early detection and appropriate uh, treatment is important, but that can be completely reversed. And then your kidney function recovers after you remove that, um, whatever that trigger it. Um, and then basically your, your kidney function gets restored and everything goes back to normal. And then we have the chronic kidney disease, which it's the kidney damage that um, unfortunately cannot be reversed. Um, can be managed, can be slowed, um, that kidney damage can be slowed down with diet modification. And I've had patients that I work with, with diet, diet and lifestyle modification, they were able to recover some, but not completely reverse it. You know, um, they had um, a certain degree of improvement in their GFR levels. But as I said, this is not uh, reversible, unfortunately. And usually the chronic kidney disease uh, can develop and can be more slow, uh, slowly through the time as opposed to the acute one that can be, can happen from one day to the other, more or less. Um, so those are the main two kinds. Um, 
detection of kidney disease. How do we know, especially with CKD, chronic kidney disease, um, how do we watch for that? So basic test, um, blood creatinine level usually increases and the glomerular filtration rate, which is known as the GFR. In the test lab test, you see it as a lower E GFR, which is estimated glomerular filtration rate. Um, and usually that goes down. So basically if the blood creatinine increases, um, the GFR goes lower, um, which means that the way I look at it is that you're losing capacity of filtration from your kidneys with the kidney damage. Um, so your, your kidneys are not filtering as well anymore. And those two blood tests, the, creat the blood creatinine and the GFR are part of the comprehensive metabolic panel, which is a regular test that most doctors will do as a screening, um, you know, for your annual um, checkup. Um, so it's not a specific test. It's part of a very regular test that also checks your fasting blood glucose and liver enzymes and other things are included in that, including the creatinine and the GFR. Uh, we can also have a urine test, and um, it's it's good to, that's why part of the annual screening, um, uh, a lot of times they ask you for a urine sample. You do that to test the presence of protein or blood in the urine, which individuals with healthy kidneys do not have proteins or blood in the urine. So the presence of protein, for example, in urine, even when your GFR is normal, may indicate that uh, you're at risk, uh, increased risk of developing CKD. So it can be one of those very early signs of, um, of CKD, even before GFR starts dropping. So it's important to do that and pay attention to, you know, if you're having protein in the urine or not. Those at risk should have their protein in the urine checked annually. And people, when we say those at risk, um, people with high blood pressure, with diabetes, uh, would be the ones that should screen annually their urine for protein, the presence of protein. Symptoms or signs of CKD, unfortunately, and that, that's why the screening is very important, because unfortunately, most people may not have any symptoms or more severe symptoms to really say, oh, something is going on here until their kidney disease is pretty advanced, maybe stage four or five. Um, so that's why it's important to do all the screening, the urine and the blood test. Um, however, you know, sometimes people have even earlier stages, some symptoms, and those can be feeling more tired, having less energy, which is a very common symptom for a lot of things. Um, sometimes, you know, um, it's hard to pinpoint what it is. Um, having trouble to concentrate, not having a great appetite, uh, not sleeping very well, muscle cramping at night can be one of the signs, uh, swollen feet and ankles, so edema, um, puffiness around the eyes, especially in the morning, and that can be also some fluid retention. Um, dry, itchy skin, um, and then the need to urinate more often, especially at night, which is kind of getting up more and more often to go to the bathroom. Um, so after all this uh, overview, we're going to focus right now on CKD. Um, as I mentioned, it's a gradual more gradual and progressive loss of kidney function over time. It doesn't really happen overnight. Um, it's named the silent killer just because often, again, has no symptoms in the early stages. Um, and then the main, main causes of CKD are still high blood pressure and diabetes. And I'm, I want to kind of emphasize uncontrolled blood pressure and uncontrolled diabetes um, probably are better kind of ways to to say that those are the main uh, causes of CKD. Um, it's estimated that almost half of indivi individuals with CKD also have diabetes um, and or self-reported cardiovascular disease. Of course, there can be other causes um, that on other conditions that can cause CKD, like glomerulonephritis, which is a kidney uh, condition. Um, 
polycystic kidney disease, lupus, um, which is autoimmune disease, but can affect kidneys too. And obstructions like kidney stones, especially repetitive kidney stones, um, occur, like reoccurrent um, tumors, enlarged prostate, uh, prostate gland in men can be one of those two, and um, recurrent urinary tract infections will develop CKD from, from those two. Um, but as I mentioned, the majority would be uncontrolled blood pressure and diabetes. Risk factors for CKD, there are two groups, non-controllable non -controllable family history of CKD or age over 60 or race, certain races are at higher risk than others. Um, but we also have controllable ones, like diabetes can be controlled, high blood pressure, if we have those as chronic conditions too, they can be controlled um, and they're less likely to affect our kidneys. Heart disease and obesity. Um, so definitely, I encourage people focus on what you can control, not what cannot be controlled. So I have a slide here with tips on how to get a better gl blood glucose control from a diet perspective. Um, I mean, if you have diabetes, taking medications as prescribed by your doctor is very important for that blood, blood sugar control. Uh, monitor how you're doing, you know, do regular labs of hemoglobin A1C, maybe check at home um, on a regular basis as, as directed. In terms of diet, eat regularly, right? Breakfast should be eaten within an hour of waking up and meals and snacks should follow every three, four hours thereafter. It's been shown that this is how we control better the blood sugar. You're not allowing big gaps of um of hours in between meals. So your blood sugar will drop too much. And then you maybe eat too big of a meal, too many carbs and your blood sugar spikes and you do those up and up and downs quite, quite often. It's easier to control how much um, you're eating, how many carbohydrates you're eating per meal and then eating regularly. So your blood sugar, it's nicely kind of wavy, you know, it's nicely regulated. Always balance your carbohydrates with protein and fats and fiber. So even when you think, oh, but this is a healthy carb, let's say I'm having a piece of fruit, always try to chase that with a handful of nuts uh, because the nuts will have protein, fat, and some fiber that will really slow down the absorption of that sugar in your blood. I looked at it and I used this example because it's a, it's a good uh, visual for a lot of people. They told me that was helpful to to see that in their head. So think about when you just eat the carbohydrate food by itself, um, that's like having a jar of sand, trying to pour their, that jar of sand will flow very fast and very easily. So the sand is the, um, sh the small sugar molecules. There's nothing there to slow it down. Having that jar of sand with bigger rocks inside you're trying to pour that jar out of the, uh, that sand out of the jar, the rocks will slow it down. So it's gonna take longer for the jar to empty. And this is what happens when you eat the small sugar molecules with bigger molecules of fat, fiber, and, and um, protein. So it will slow down the absorption of the sugar in your blood, which is very important for blood sugar control. Um, choose whole grains when possible. They these digest slower and minimize blood sugar spikes, and that's because they have fiber. Um, so try to use more complex carbohydrates with fiber um, compared with the refined white ones that do not have fiber, and they break down very fast in sugar molecules, and they spike your blood sugar. So um, the complex carbohydrates with fiber can be whole grains, can be starchy vegetables like beans and peas and corn and potatoes with skin and um, winter squashes and fruits. Fruits have fiber too, but they're carbohydrates. They will turn into sugar into your blood. But those are kind of good carbs because they have fiber. And when you choose those, you still want to get some protein and fat. You, know, you eat that brown rice with a piece of chicken and extra fiber from vegetables. Um, you eat that potato again, some um, fish and, and uh, again, more vegetables. You eat that fruit for a snack with a handful of nuts for extra fat. 
Um, I just said limit refined carbohydrates and simple sugars. They, those they tend to spike your blood sugar the most. Exercise regularly, physical activity, any kind of muscle contraction um, will lower your blood sugar. Uh, so it really helps a lot with lowering blood sugar when you exercise. It doesn't matter what you do, do what you like as long as you're moving. So even like taking a walk after a meal can help with lowering that blood sugar. Um, and then very important, control the amount of carbohydrates consuming each meal and spread them as much as possible evenly throughout the day. So you don't want to eat a big plate of pasta, for example. You want to have a little bit of pasta, maybe some chicken, and maybe a salad on the side or other vegetables. So then this way, it's not too much carb, and that carb has protein, fat, and extra fiber. So those are the most important things that uh, you could do from a diet perspective um, to help you managing that blood sugar, which managing that blood sugar, it's a, it's a very important uh, way to protect your kidney. Blood pressure. I found this on the web. Uh, blood pressure. Um, so basically, how do you manage blood pressure? The goal for CKD would be to be under 130 to 80 uh, for that systolic and diastolic. Um, again, take medications as prescribed by your doctor. Check your blood pressure regularly if you have a device at home. Um, that would be helpful to keep an eye on it. Manage stress. Um, we know that when we're stressed, blood pressure goes up. So if you feel like you have a lot of stress in your diet, uh, in your diet, in your life, even though your diet may be good, your exercise may be good, if the stress is kind of not controlled, your blood pressure may still run higher. So I would focus on stress management. Um, deep breathing, meditation, exercise, and other, you know, um, take an hour of your day for self-care, for engaging in things you like and, and bring joy and pleasure to your life or or just take a break, you know, from everything. Um, reduce sodium. So sodium is very important um, in managing blood pressure because, um, um you know, there are different mechanisms how can increase your your uh, blood pressure, including it can make your arteries more stiff, and then the the pressure can build up in in your arteries if the arteries are not as elastic and flexible. But another way, a simple way, is that sodium kind of uh, drags more and holds on to to water. and then basically can increase the blood volume and that can increase the blood pressure too. So reducing sodium is an important part of um, of managing blood pressure. We have the DASH diet, which stands uh, uh, for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And it's been shown with a lot of research studies that's the most effective in managing blood pressure. Um, it's, a, it's a diet low in sodium, low in saturated fat and sugar, and it's very rich in fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, but also lean protein like chicken, fish. Um, um, and again, it's a very effective way to manage um, blood pressure. Um, what I wanted to say is that when I say less sodium, you know, we want to limit to 2000 milligrams or less a day. And I could tell that um, for some people say, oh, that's not much. And some people say, oh, that's quite a bit. And it depends if you eat out a lot, if you eat a lot of processed foods or already prepare meals, maybe frozen meals or things like that, that 2000 a uh, milligram a day may not seem a lot because those are high in sodium and you could use that budget very quickly. However, if you tend to cook more at home, use more whole food ingredients, that budget actually can get a, uh, can go a long way and can be quite enough. So keeping in mind about 75% of the sodium in our food environment comes from restaurant, restaurant eating and processed foods, packaged foods. It's very important to manage how often you're having those kind of foods in your diet. Um, stages of CKD. Um, so they're mainly based on the estimated GFR. 
the rate at which the blood is filtered to the kidneys every minute, because that's what the glomerular filtration rate means. How much kind of the rate at which the blood is filtered every minute. And again, the less the number is, the less blood is filtered. So the capacity of filtration is reduced. Um, GFR is calculated using a formula and blood creatinine level is needed along other factors to, to be plugged in that formula. Normal GFR ranges from 90 to 120, depending on who you are. You know, we, we have th this number is considered to be kind of normal. Uh, but, but then we have stage one, which is more 90 or higher. It's not even basically AD, right? Because I said normal is 90 to 120. So this is kidney damage with normal kidney function. I don't even... I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I won't be worried at this, this stage, right? Um, stage two, it's a kidney damage with mild loss of kidney function. So you, the GFR is between 89 to 60 to 89. And you can see here on this, a, um, this picture how it shows, you know, you lose some like small percentage of your function, but you still have a lot of filtration capacity. Then stage 3A, um, so stage 3, it's uh, actually split in between 3A and 3B. Um, mild to moderate loss of kidney function would be between 45 to 59, and 3B moderate to severe loss of kidney function would be from 30 to 44. And then stage 4, severe loss of kidney function, 20, 15 to 29, and then stage 5, it's basically 15 or less, uh, less than 15. And that's uh, already kidney failure. At that point, people um, prepare or talk about dialysis, um, kidney transplant. Um, so the capacity of filtration is pretty reduced. Um, so those are the stages. And um, I'm going to move along. And with the stage five CKD options, I mentioned hemodialysis can be also peritoneal dialysis and kidney transplant. So those are kind of the options. But we're not going to go into those today because the role of this um, class series is actually to talk about how to prevent further damage, how to manage CKD in more like earlier stages than stage five when, again, those are the options. So we're not going to address those in today's lecture. Um, ways to prevent or manage CKD. Uh, physical activity, it's very important for ki kidney's health. And it's important for a lot of, um, in general, for health in general. I, I don't even think of a condition that physical activity cannot help with. From mental health to diabetes to cardiovascular disease, kidney, um, you know, muscle and bone health. Um, it's very, very important. I think a lot of my clients, usually when they meet with me, they ask me, especially for weight loss, they ask me about a magic pill that we don't have. But I, and I keep saying, I don't, we don't have a magic pill, a magic wand. But when I'm thinking about physical activity, it is actually the magic pill. And it's uh, very important for our health. Um, so with some people, depending on the stage you're at, your physical ability, you might need some PT guidance or medical guidance to do it safely. Um, and and that, that's fine. That doesn't mean you cannot do it, but you need to be more careful. Um, another, uh, another way is to limit sodium. Again, that's important for blood pressure, but it's also important for uh, healthy kidneys to limit that sodium intake. And we have the same recommendation, try to get to 2000 milligrams of sodium or less a day. Control blood sugar, blood pressure. As we talk, it's very important because actually uncontrolled blood sugar and uncontrolled blood pressure are the ones that can damage further the kidneys. And I want to give you a visual for Remember I said each nephron has the glomerulus and that's like a very, very a dense sieve. So think about those small capillary, those blood vessels that are so small within each glomerulus. If you have a lot of pressure in your, in your blood, um, those can pop 
you know, th those can actually get um, um, popped, ruptured. And, and again, it's like you have holes in your sieve and that sieve is not gonna filtrate well anymore. Quit smoking. If you're smoking, reduce alcohol consumption to a drink a day if you're female, to maximum two drinks a day if you're male. Um, those also um, shown as protecting the kidneys and modifying your diet. More to come next week. Um, we'll discuss in detail about um, needs for protein, sodium, phosphorus, potassium, all those things that you might have question about. But I could tell you. Um, especially in earlier stages, like two, three, A, three B, even stage four, a lot of people, um, a, a lot of people do much better with the plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, plant-based diet doesn't mean you need, need to become vegan or vegetarian, but it means that when, um, most of the time, 80, 90% of your meals, when you look at that plate, I'll show you a picture that I have here about uh, three quarters of your plate is plant-based in between your vegetables, your healthy starch, and just a quarter of your plate is your lean protein, like chicken, fish, um, and, and others. But um, again, we'll talk more next week. Um, and um, a plant-based diet seems to actually have less acid load and put less, um, um, uh, less strain on your kidneys, uh, a, a plant-based diet controls better diabetes and blood pressure, also has more anti-inflammatory properties because the plant-based foods um, have um, phytochemicals that can help fight inflammation that happens in the body for different reasons. Um, so there are lots of benefits um, that can come from this dietary pattern. And as I said, we'll talk more next week. Um, I'm going to show you this. I'll go very quickly through it. But research shows making nutrition therapy has a role in slowing the progression of CKD, delaying the need for dialysis and improving nutritional biomarkers. Um, and it's important to know and, and, and see that because I had quite a few patients over the years that um, told me that unfortunately, even sometimes medical providers like nephrologists may have told them, oh, diet doesn't matter. And it, you know, it matters. It can make a difference. It can make um, you feel better and, um, again, slow the progression of the sleep. We can reverse it, as I mentioned. But if you keep it where you have and preserve that kidney function that you have, this is kind of what you need because your kidneys will still function pretty well um, when, uh, you know, I showed you all those stages and, and um, how much how much filtration uh, function you have preserved. So it, it really makes a difference. Um, the nutrients of concern in general for CKD, sodium, phosphorus, potassium, protein, fluids, more details next week. And as I said, um, it doesn't mean everybody with CKD, any stage will have to, um, you know, pay attention to all of those. I would say sodium, everybody should, even a healthy, you know, because sodium can um, increase blood pressure, can affect your kidneys. I think overall sodium is an important um, uh, nutrient to manage, but phosphorus, potassium, fluids, those may not need to be restrictive and restricted in a less very late stage of CKD. And based on also labs and symptoms and every, each individual's presentation, which can be different. Um, protein, it's also something that we don't need to restrict completely, but we need to be careful and not overconsume because the uh, waste material from protein foods, actually, they can put more strain on the kidneys and you don't want to, again, make them work harder when you lose kidney function. Um, but you don't have to be overly restrictive um, depending on the stage you are, but you will have to, again, watch and portion control your protein foods. More to come. Um, now, I have a list with complications of CKD and um, those um, are things like gout, anemia, metabolic acidosis, 
secondary hyperparathyroidism, um, bone disease and high phosphorus, like hyper high phosphorus is also called hyperphosphatemia, heart disease, high potassium, which is hyperkalemia, fluid buildup or edema. So there are lots of complications. We're going to go through all of them. But before that, because gout is the first one, um, Twin has a poll for you that she prepares. So there are a few questions that you'll be able to ask as a kind of a multiple choice right on your screen. You want to say more, Twin, about that? Yes. Um, I don't know if anybody can see me, but I think that you. because I I pinned uh, Elena, so that means Elena's screen was the only one showing for a little bit. But yes, I do have a poll. It's a quick three question poll. And I would really appreciate if everyone could get their mouse or their hands ready so that you can answer the questions. And Twin, um, do I need to stop sharing the screen or can I keep it on? You can keep it on. Okay. All right. So we have the first question. Do you know someone who has gout? Um, and there are four choices whether it is you have gout, you don't know anyone with gout, or you do, um, and or if you don't know what gout is. The next question is a true or false. So you should see the poll uh, in front of, on your screen right now, and you should be able to uh, select your answer. The next question is a true or false, an unhealthy weight or lifestyle, Poor, such as poor diet and heavy drinking uh, are the main causes of gout. True, false, or you don't know. Last question, what parts of the body can gout affect? Foot, elbow, hands, fingers, knees, kidneys, eyes, heart, spine, all of the above or none of the above? Go ahead and take your time with this poll. We will reconvene with Elena in about two, three minutes. Okay. I like that I could see how people actually are answering those questions. Yeah. Very kind of instant. There's no surprise. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for participating. Yes, thank you everyone for taking the time to take this quick poll. We it, also I think want to make nice. sure you're paying attention and you did not fall asleep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's that time of the day, it's around 4.20. <laughs> you know, it's a difficult time. <laughs> Your brain starts to go a little slower. You might feel some you might feel some sluggishness um, or sleepy. And I know exactly what you're talking about. I, the 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. feeling is um, really unavoidable for me. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's that time of the day. Mm -hmm. All right. So about 70 or about 80% of our participants have answered the poll. If anyone else would like to get in on it, please let me know or go ahead and do the poll. But we will be ending the poll in about a minute. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll. Let's see the results. Can everybody here see the results? So Elena, why don't you uh, dispel some of these misconceptions if there are any? Um, is it true well, that an unhealthy weight or lifestyle such as heavy drinking or poor diet could be the main cause of gout? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, definitely can. I, I hear a lot of um, people kind of um, um, having those triggers, right? When they have gout, I think there is also a combination of being more susceptible and um, having a metabolic disorder that can 
make you more susceptible to how you um, process the purines in food. And, and you know, um, it's a combination of things for sure. But um, but I could tell that a lot of times um, it develops and, and the, those are the triggers, right? Unhealthy diet, more heavy drinking, um, diets high in red meat and um, organ meats, things like that can can be um, big triggers for gout. Um, I like that I saw, you know, I don't know what gout is. So we have some participants, which is good because we're going to talk about it. Um, I'm happy also to see that not a lot of you have gout, um, but more seems to know someone who has gout. And then also quite a few people don't know someone that has gout. Um, it's an interesting combination. Um, so I think with the second one, a lot of people responded true. And the third one, uh, a lot of people responded food, especially big toe seems to be more common. Um, um, but they can actually develop in other parts of the body too. Does that include eyes, heart, and spine? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, honestly, I don't know if somebody can help with that. Uh, I wish we would have a nurse <laughs> in our, um, because I, yeah, I, I, it's usually kind of joints and um, mainly the toes and um, thumbs, um, fingers, hands, elbows, yeah. I can add a little bit to that in the sense that, um, yeah, gout is, is a, a, a situation where um, there's protein uh, buildup in your articulations. What that means all the joints that are moving, like your wrists, your, your fingers, your knees, uh, your feet. Uh, but uh, in reality, it can't develop in, in any bone articulation where, where bone meets bone. Uh, so, uh, Again, uh, it can develop in, in those those joint uh, unions, uh, but most commonly in the, the the ones that are fairly movable around the elbows, the knees, uh, the feet. And then with respect to, um, I saw a question I think in the in the um, question uh, section with respect to um, gout uh, and also uh, CKD and um, whether. Uh, chronic kidney disease causes gout. It's actually the other way around. Uh, in most cases, it's the a problem with the gout and the accumulation protein uh, proteins in the articulations uh, and other parts of the body that end up also coalescing uh, in the kidney as the blood is going, you know, through being filtered. Some of those proteins. Uh, accumulate in the kidney, and over time, the excess proteins cause kidney damage that can uh, begin to cause uh, chronic kidney disease in all the the, the uh, areas that you mentioned in terms of kidney function. Basics, they basic. But uh, if, if if people want to really uh, look into it, uh, please, you know, al always uh, talk to your healthcare provider, and it's always a good question to ask because, uh, as we know especially those of you that are listening today, we do have a lot of uh, uh, individual uh, areas, uh, regions within uh, our wonderful country that have high numbers of individuals that may be prone uh, to gout, especially uh, people of certain ages and certain uh, age uh, population groups. So keep in mind and, and uh, always, again, uh, make sure that you're getting a regular checkups, that you're getting follow-up care for your primary conditions. And, and the idea being that if you manage and take care of your primary conditions, I think you can uh, safely manage uh, your medical uh, issues uh, in, in a good way uh, by doing all the, the wonderful things that uh, doctors are, are recommending for treatment. Thank you so much for that, Franco. Um, Elena? Yes. Well, why don't we go back to your uh, slide? Okay. Are you ready to move on? Yeah, I'm going to start sharing here, right, the poll so we can close the, the poll. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're going to start with um, gout. Looks like there's a delay in my uh, moving the slides again. Uh, so, you know, a bit patient. Okay. So, um, 
um, it seems to be both ways that the CKD increases the risk of gout, but also gout can lead to CKD. So it's, it kind of goes both ways. Um, and the gout, what, what is gout? It's a type of arthritis that causes swelling and pain in your joints. And that happens when uric acid accumulates in your blood. And uric acid, acid is made from purine breakdown. So there are those types of proteins in mainly in protein foods that we eat um, um, called purines. And then when they break down and they're metabolized in our body, they um, become uric acid. And this uric acid, as I said, can accumulate um, in your blood and then actually it can form those very small sharp crystals that build up around your joints under your skin and that can cause pain and swelling and redness warmth stiffness so can really move that joint very easily it's very painful you know i never had a gout attack i know people that had and i have worked with patients that had also and they just describe being very painful um and from a gout management perspective, um, you know, medications as recommended by your doctor, they prescribe the NSAIDs, those non-inflammatory, um, uh, uh, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medication. Um, Colchicine is one of the medications too, and steroids sometimes are needed to kind of decrease that inflammation and help with the gout attack while we, right? Because the pain can be very uh, intense. And then you just, once the inflammation decreases, then, you know, um, it, it goes away basically. But from a diet perspective, uh, avoiding alcohol is very important as well as foods high in purines. Um, and um, adequate hydration is very important. You need to kind of drink a lot of water ice packs to keep the joint cool, um, keep pressure off the affected joint once you have a gout attack and elevate the affected joint as much as possible. In terms of uh, nutrition therapy, again, the, I said avoid uh, foods high in purines and those are things um, that, uh, things like anchovies, asparagus, animal organs, um, in my kidney liver, herring, gravy, um, the gravy and um, accumulates a lot of uh, purines and and um, dried beans can have quite a bit in peas, macro, mushrooms, mussels, sardines. Those are some of the highest uh, um, sources of um, purine in our diet. Then you want to avoid high protein diet. So you could still have Red meat tends to be more of a trigger than chicken and fish, but with everything, red meat, chicken and fish, you want to limit the amount of um, protein consumed. So you want to have maybe two to three ounces serving for a meal, uh, which would be the size and the thickness of a deck of cards, um, which, you know, I said part of the plant-based diet, that would be what we recommend to everyone, healthy individuals or people who want to manage better CKD. You know, this is about that core of a play that I was talking about, the size and the thickness of a deck of cards. Um, adequate hydration, as I mentioned, it's important. Avoid alcohol, healthy body weight. So if you're overweight in the overweight or obese category, losing some weight will be helpful. And also eating regular meals every four hours seems to help with not um, creating as much uric acid from uh, from the foods we're eating so um so that would be another thing to to do on a regular basis to manage gout uh, the next um complication of ckd is anemia um and commonly in people with ckd the anemia usually um um anemia worsens as ckd worsens if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, I said the kidneys make a hormone called erythropoietin um, that signals your body to make red blood cells. 
But as your kidney function decreases, those late stages, ability of kidney to actually make that hormone is decreased, and then you're not making as many red blood cells, and that can create anemia. Um, we make new, uh, new red blood cells every 115 days, so we can recycle them, recycle them very fast. And the red blood cells, just as a reminder, their biggest role in our body. So those are the cells that are part of our body, uh, part of our blood, and they give that red color because um, they carry oxygen through the whole body. Um, so there's a hemoglobin molecule part of the red blood cells, an iron molecule, and the oxygen kind of gets attached to that. And that's how those red blood cells carry oxygen to every part of our body. And um, as the kidney function decreases, you may not make enough of this erythropoietin and you'll have less red blood cells available to carry oxygen, which can make you feel tired, weak, fatigue, right? Um, if your cells are not getting the oxygen needed, um, people tend to have pale skin, um, dizziness, loss of concentration, chest pain, shortness of breath, and cold intolerance. So those are the the symptoms uh, of anemia. And of course, um, as part of the CBC, um, um, the blood, blood count uh, panel, you could test that and see if you're anemic or not. Anemia management um, depends on the cause of your anemia, can include, um, again, if it's determined that, well, it's a decreased um, amount of that erythropoietin produced by your kidneys, erythropoiesis stimulating agents can be helpful. So you're gonna have to take, if your body doesn't make, make that uh, hormone, you kind of have to take it um, through a medication, iron supplements sometimes are needed um, to help, especially, you know, if people are iron deficient. Um, if on dialysis, you may get an iron supplement during your treatment. And then the red blood cell transfusion, sometimes it's needed. People get blood transfusions um, um, to help with anemia and the numbers are very low. But for most um, CKD patients, they need to take this erythropoiesis stimulating agents. Metabolic acidosis, it's another complication of CKD. And um, it's basically a buildup of acid, acid in your body. One of the role of the kidneys is to keep, remember I said, um, a good balance of acid and alkaline. Maybe I didn't say it this way. Now that I'm thinking back, but, um, you know, it keeps the electrolyte balance, but also acid um, alkaline balance. And um, it's basically trying to keep a good pH in your body. So when your kidneys may not work as well, it can happen that you know, that balance is not happening and more build uh, up of acid happens in the body. Symptoms include feeling tired, weak, uh, nausea, vomiting is one of the symptoms, not having a good appetite, uh, tachycardia or, or fast heartbeat, headaches, long deep breaths. Those can be signs of uh, metabolic acidosis. Um, the consequence of that would be that it can worsen CKD, um, can increase the risk of osteoporosis, muscle loss, inflammation. Uh, management, it's usually sodium bicarbonate. People need to take that, but it's not appropriate for some people who need to restrict sodium. So it's always good to check with your doctor. It needs to be basically prescribed and recommended by a doctor, uh, the sodium bicarbonate. And what helps from a nutrition perspective is to replace uh, animal-based protein with plant-based protein, and that may lower the acid load. And remember I said with the plant-based diet, that also helps in general because the acidic, um, um, so the foods that create the more acidic urine, not acidic blood, because the pH in our blood is very narrow range uh, and our body has different mechanism to keep it. No matter, let's say if we eat just meat, meat, meat all day, you're still not gonna have an acidic blood because your body needs to 
you know, keep a very narrow range of pH, otherwise we die. Um, but your urine may become more acidic because that's where the kidneys are all come in place. So um, there are different buffer mechanisms to maintain that balance. But if you ate something more acidic, that means your your urine is going to be more acidic. Your your kidneys will excrete more of that acid. So, so the pH stays um, in your blood, stays um, within that narrow range. So the urine can be more acidic or more alkaline based on what we eat. And the animal-based type of foods tend to create a bigger acid load in our urine and more acidic urine. And then the plant-based foods tend to create more an alkaline type of urine. So um, usually the animal-based foods tend to be also proteins like meats, eggs, dairy products, chicken. And that's why... Um, we're saying replacing animal-based fruit with plant-based protein can lower the, the acid load. Plant-based protein foods can be nuts and seeds, can be beans, can be tofu, edamame beans, or any whole soy foods. In general, those are the ones. Uh, quinoa, it's one of the um, grains that uh, it's higher in protein and uh, can count as a plant-based protein. Um, secondary hyperthyroidism. So over-secretion of parathyroid um, hormone happens uh, when people have kidney failure so um, or kidney disease. So what happens is that um, as you progress and have CKD, your body ability to activate that vitamin D decreases. Remember I said one of the roles of your kidneys is to activate vitamin D. If, um, if you have a decreased activation of vitamin D in your uh, body, that decreases the gastrointestinal absorption of calcium. So now you're not absorbing very well the calcium you're eating, even though let's say you might eat uh, enough calcium. And um, that's, that sends kind of like a positive feedback to the parathyroid glands, and that will increase the parathyroid hormone, saying we need more of that to bring calcium up. Um, so, but what happens when this um, parathyroid hormone increases in your blood, that decreases the um, kidney ability to excrete phosphorus. And that basically creates this secondary hyper um, parathyroidism and um, keeps the calcium also low. So it's this like, in a way, vicious cycle um, that you have now high phosphorus in your blood, you have low vitamin D, you have low calcium. Um, and basically, you can actually um, create bone disease, increase risk of osteoporosis because your body will pull more calcium from your bones to help with the level, the low levels of calcium in your blood. Uh, it can create bone and joint pain, kidney stones, um, urinating more often, loss of appetite, feeling weak. Those are, again, some of the symptoms of this process that can happen. Um, and management is uh, usually some vitamin D in an active form. Supplements are recommended and calcium just to help with the calcium absorption. Calcimimetics that, that will mimic kind of calcium and will tell your parathyroid to make less of that hormone. And then, um, then of course, we have like if it's kidney failure, late stage, I dialysis kidney transplant will kind of fix this. But this is a secondary thing that happens when your kidneys are failing. Um, and I know it might be a little bit complicated, but um, basically it's a cascade of negative things that happen because your kidneys are not able to do their job. They're not able to activate that vitamin D. All this cascade kind of starts happening. And then bone disease can um, form. Phosphorus can accumulate in your blood as kidney function decreases. And um, probably you've heard 
or maybe you read online um, in um, more later stages when blood phosphorus starts to increase, people usually need to adjust their diet, need to take medication like phosphate binders to help actually lower the phosphorus that's higher in the blood. Um, the foods, usually what we say with phosphorus, so first of all, not at every stage people need to reduce phosphorus. Um, when when your phosphorus levels are starting to increase, when you have this um, uh, secondary parathyroidism developing, a lot of people, yeah, may need to take phosphate binders and um, um, adjust their diet and limit the phosphates from foods. I uh, will talk more next week about that, but there are some natural phosphate in foods, um, natural phosphorus, right? Which a lot of those foods are healthy foods and, and this natural occurring phosphorus is not as absorbable as the um, phosphate additives that are added to our food. Um, those are highly absorbable. And I tell people as a starting point, try to avoid phosphate additives. So less processed food, read ingredient list and look for phosphates, right? Um, there are drinks like dark color sodas, uh, like Coca-Cola or Dr. Pepper, cocoa drinks like a hot chocolate or beer and um, canned um, iced tea usually tends to have more of those or other drinks that have phosphates in, in them. Um, and again, taking the phosphate binders and then so. Those are things that you could do to manage this hyperphosphatemia that can happen with high phosphorus in your blood. Um, so I talked already about that. Take phosphate binders with your meals so the phosphate that you're eating can bind and be flushed out of your body, not absorb into your blood. Limit phosphorus to eat and drink. Mainly pay attention to phosphate additives in foods. And then take the calcitriol supplement, which is an active form of vitamin D that help increase calcium absorption in your intestines and exercise daily, which helps your body get rid of the phosphate phosphorus. So um, exercise is another kind of way where exercise can help quite a bit. Heart disease is another complication and CKD increases the risk of uh, heart disease, but also heart disease increases the risk of CKD. So it's one of those conditions, again, that can go both ways. Um, complications of CKD can increase risk of heart disease, anemia, high blood pressure, high homocysteine levels, unbalanced phosphorus calcium levels. So those, so patients with CKD are definitely at higher risk of heart disease. Prevention would be manage weight, blood glucose, blood cholesterol, blood pressure, that phosphorus calcium balance, um, follow a heart healthy diet, which is still a plant-based Mediterranean diet that's plant-based, high fiber, low saturated fat and sugar, watch sodium in your diet, exercise regularly, manage stress and take meds as prescribed. You see a lot of those are repetitive, which is a good thing, you know, when you look at those dietary patterns, you could see with how many things it can help. So this watching sodium in my diet can have my blood pressure, re reducing risk of heart disease and um, actually protecting my kidneys. Um, so um, they're just kind of reinforcement, reinforcements of um, those very basic dietary patterns that can be helpful. Um, another complication is hypotassium or hyperkalemia, which potassium is a mineral and an electrolyte, right? As we know, um, it's involved in muscle contraction. So it's very important um, in muscle contraction. And when you think about muscles, you think about heart because heart is a muscle. And um, one of the biggest thing with hypotassium or hyperkalemia is that it can create unusual heartbeat, arrhythmia, can um, create cardiac arrest. So it's kind of life-threatening if it goes too high and it's too, um, um, yeah, if, if, if it goes too high. As kidney function declines, the potassium tends to accumulate in your body. Um, so what happens normally 
when the kidneys work properly. If you eat more potassium from your foods, um, your kidneys will just eliminate more and maintain in your blood a, a good level. As, as the kidney function decreases, the potassium is the kidneys are not able to kind of get rid of potassium as as much and then that tends to accumulate more in your blood creating this state of hyperkalemia and again the symptoms are feeling tired and weak which is a very repetitive symptom in all those complications but also nausea muscle pain muscle cramps again the unusual heartbeat and arrhythmia trouble breathing chest pain um, as a management, a low potassium diet and medication like potassium binders, the way we have with phosphorus, we have with potassium too. And the low potassium diet, it doesn't mean you have to avoid. Potassium is very prevalent in foods. So a lot of foods, especially healthy foods, will have potassium, a bunch of fruits and vegetables, protein foods too. So it's not very realistic to say you can stop eating potassium from foods because a lot of foods will have potassium. It's more about lowering the amount. And I talk with my clients about really uh, being aware of the high potassium foods and managing how often, how much they have of that. So then they're not eating same um, amounts of, of potassium when they have hyperkalemia. You really want to keep it on the lower side, which lower can be somewhere still between 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams a day, two to three grams. So there is a budget and um, it doesn't mean it needs to be a potassium free diet. Fluid buildup, I think was the last one um, or edema as kidney function declines. Again, that happens more in the late stage or kidney failure, um, extra fluid accumulates in the body and that increased blood pressure, put more strain on your heart and lungs. Um, Symptoms would be faster heartbeat, swelling in your feet and ankles, what we call edema. And management would be some fluid restriction. Um, so um, people, you know, the doctor would recommend a fluid restriction and uh, people usually track their fluid intake. Um, and a good reminder is that some foods like soup, ice cream, popsicle can count as fluid, even though we may not think of them as fluid. So on a fluid restriction, you want to make sure you stay within, again, a budget in a day so that that doesn't put um, too much strain on the, the kidney, kidneys that I cannot eliminate as much. As we know, in late stages, sometimes people do not um, urinate as much. The volume of urine decreases, and it doesn't make sense to, you know, drink a lot of fluids. Since your body cannot eliminate that, of course, you're going to create this fluid overload Low sodium diet is important because remember I said more sodium and salty foods will actually retain that uh, fluid more in your body, will make you also thirsty and you want to drink more, which is not a good idea. And um, of course, a lot of people with uh, fluid buildup, they need to take diuretics, water pills or kind of medications can help you urinate more. Um, but I want to emphasize, as I talk with a lot of people, Usually the fluid restriction need happens in some patients more in kidney failure before they start dialysis. So it's not something that's across the board. Actually, for somebody stage three, um, A, B, or even four, um, drinking more fluids, it's, it's actually a good idea to help your kidneys, um, um, you know, filter everything and and um, metabolize all the substances and medications and other things you're taking. Um, so it's good to have a good fluid intake, but it's more in those particular where um, basically your kidneys are failing and you're not able to produce enough urine and all that fluid will build up in your body, creating, putting strain on your heart and lungs, as I mentioned. And I think that's the end of my presentation for today. And we have... Um, about 10 minutes for questions. Elena, um, we have about 15 que uh, 14 questions here. Why don't okay. I go ahead and read them out to you so that you can answer. Yeah. Uh, feel free to defer some of these questions towards the later sessions in case they might be more relevant towards yeah. the second or third class. And Franco, of course, you're welcome to jump in at any moment. Um, 
So the I first question, uh, the first question is, can CKD be completely reversed? No. Very short, but sweet. Um, are there any alternatives to kidney dialysis? Um, I think as we mentioned, it's dialysis can be hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and then kidney transplant. I, as far as I know, there are not other, um, at this point, other options. That's correct. Okay. And uh, even with the transplant, we also have a couple of options in terms of the live transplant and the cadaver uh, transplant. And so it, it's something that I think with people are in that stage, uh, something to consider. Uh, and we're, you know, open to, to helping those individuals out if they're in that situation. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any electronic medical devices that continuously measure blood pressure? There are, uh, which is our little, I think, more recently, the smartwatches. Uh, quite a few of them advertise that they measure uh, continuously your blood pressure. However, I'm not quite sure and haven't read any uh, articles uh, that kind of uh, look at it, look at that clinic in the sense of how accurate they are. Uh, but if you're able to have a regular uh, machine that you puff up with a little bulb uh, and you know how to uh, work it, um, I think it's probably uh, you know always good to to double check. Uh, if you have, if you wear a smartwatch that has that function, uh, periodically check manually uh, at home with the with the machine just to be double uh, double sure. Then obviously, if you feel you have any symptoms that may be uh, related to it, obviously tell your uh, healthcare provider about it. Sounds good. That's a um, great I, idea. Yeah, to double check. That's a good idea. I also want to include that uh, while we are knowledgeable in areas that Elena and Franco can speak to, we are not uh, doctors, so that if you have any specific questions that pertain to your health, please consult your doctor. Um, next question. Uh, this, might this might be something you want to save towards next week, Elena, but what foods are harmful for someone with kidney issues? Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk more in detail, but I could tell you, um, you know, harmful, it, it depends. Like if you have diabetes, again, sugary things are not a good idea just because of that. Uh, again, processed foods high in sodium, high, high in those phosphate additives are not as great. Um, and there's no necessary uh, a food. And especially I want to emphasize like a whole food that I would, I would just say, let's say mango. I'm just speaking. It's like, oh, no, there's no such a thing. Even though, let's say somebody needs to manage potassium, you can still have it. It's a healthy food, get, gives you a different nutrients. You might just need to know how much to have. So they're not really big no-nos in terms of never have that food ever again. Um, it's more understanding what those dietary patterns need to be and trying to avoid as much as possible processed foods, high in sugar and salt. That's the bottom line. Thank you, Elena. Um, this also might be a question to be saved, but what foods or supplements promote kidney health or slow down CKD progression or can even damage your kidneys? Do you have any advice for nocturia? Um, so again, a plant-based diet seems to be beneficial to really help those earlier stages to slow down the progression. Um, and and um, again, I will give you an idea next week about, um, and actually in the third week when we kind of put things into a kind of more like a meal plan, um, how, like what a healthy diet for your kidneys look like, but it, it is a plant-based Mediterranean diet, more whole foods, um, a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seed legumes, lean proteins. Um, um, yeah. And there are no specific foods again, let's say, okay, this food has been shown to slow the progression of kidney disease, avocados. I'm just saying, <laughs> There's, there's no such a thing. It's all about dietary patterns. And also with those dietary patterns, it's just like, if you follow those 80, 90% of the time, doesn't have to be 100% of the time. 
that's kind of what you want. The What you do majority of your meals in a week, maybe those one or two meals that are exceptions are not going to affect you as much in terms of health or chronic kidney disease health. Um, but the 80, 90% of the time you're kind of following a good, um, a good balanced diet. And as I said, we'll look at some more examples for week two and three. Um, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Um, it's a good question, but, uh, for now, um, we don't have much in terms of, especially studies that linked, uh, beneficial health effects with intermittent fasting and CKD. So we can really make a recommendation. I can tell you with the, I think overall can be helpful as a dietary pattern for different things like weight management, blood sugar control. And again, if diabetes, it's what affects your kidneys the most indirectly can help you. Um, but the, unfortunately, I see a big variety of studies that are uh, that are actually testing different protocols of intermittent fasting. They're not. Um, we just need a lot of studies to test the only like one single protocol to figure out what's working. But right now we have over nine thirty now intermittent fasting. We have fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. We have in fasting. Um, uh, different pattern of fasting in terms of not eating for two days and then eating. It's all over the, uh, the, the board overall. And it's very hard to, because some shows certain benefits in terms of health, not specifically CKD. But the problem is that we need to reproduce the same type of protocol of intermittent fasting over and over and over again until we really say, oh, this can be helpful helpful for the majority of people with this condition, which we're not there yet. So um, I usually individually, when I meet with a client that's interested in using it, I look at different factors. Um, I try to get uh, one that's not as extreme uh, because a lot of people, especially if you're older, if you take medication to control blood sugar and you're not eating for a long time, may not be good for you, you know, as opposed to other people that take less medication, they might be younger and then they could try it. You know, it's not going to be harmful, but sometimes in certain, um, certain scenarios, um, people can do more harm than, than, than good when they're trying the intermittent fasting, depending on the kind. And again, the evidence right now is not clear. We can really strongly recommend it, um, but may be helpful in the future. Thank you, Elena. Um, could kidney pain be a common or could common kidney pain be signs of early stage CKD? Can be, uh, but not very common. Uh, I think when, when as, as I think uh, Elena mentioned at the beginning in terms of describing some of the uh, structure and the physiology of the kidney, uh, unfortunately, uh, as we know, a lot of uh, diseases are silent. And we really don't get uh, even the symptoms that we know that result from a particular organ uh, malfunctioning. In the case, in our case, the kidney, you know, all the th symptoms that we talked that Elena talked about. Unfortunately, we don't see those until very late in the game when the uh, damage and the uh, issue that caused it or is causing it has been present for a very long time. However. Uh, there are certain situations like a kidney stone or where your kidney is not filtering uh, very well early on and you're developing maybe uh, the formation of uh, calculi stones in the kidney that can get lodged in the in the whole structural uh, kidney tissue. It can cause uh, pain early and initially, uh, but that's uh, for the most part very rare compared to all the other uh, diseases and, and uh, conditions that impact uh, kidneys. Uh, so yes, they can cause um, stage uh, uh, early CKD pain, but very rare. Uh, again, uh, we I want people to remember that kidney disease in general is very silent as much as we talk about as well, uh, diabetes and high blood pressure and, and heart disease that are also very silent. And, and the importance being that we have to really make sure that we take care of ourselves, that we get our yearly checkups, that we get testing from head to toe. It's not just about going to a doctor 
and getting checked, but making sure that they're doing all the laboratory work uh, that needs to, to be done, as well as all the looking uh, in the different parts of, of our bodies to make sure that everything is okay. And if it isn't, that's what we want to know, that something is not working well and taking, you know, hopefully, you know, having uh, options to, to manage it or to, to take care of it before it, it gets worse. So I think that's important to remember. Franco, this next question might also be something you could answer. Can an otherwise healthy 80-year-old get a transplant? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Uh, if and when that individual is in a good state of health. Um, and uh, as of today, there is really no particular age limit for a person that uh, can donate one or a, a receptor or somebody that receiving uh, not only kidney, but other organs. So the, the big if is, uh, and importance is that to understand that the individual that is either giving up the organ or receiving it has to be in good state of health. And there's a lot of testing uh, and, and different um, examinations that are done to in order to determine that. So um, no, there isn't necessarily an age limit uh, uh, for transplant or for uh, organ donation, at least kidney-wise. Thank you. Um, this next question is about the worsening of CKD conditions. Does all uh, does all CKD conditions or do all CKD conditions worsen over time, uh, where the person will need dialysis or transplant? And that's the point I think uh, Elena mentioned and uh, pointed to it a bit uh, early on in, in in the sense that. Um, there really is no uh, reversing in the sense that you can't, once a kidney is damaged, it depends on how much damage the, the condition caused within the kidney architecture. Um, and so you can stop it uh, at a point where it's at and, and prevent it from progressing forward. Uh, but you don't necessarily can make it better to stage one, so to speak. Um, you can, the, the point of all the management, uh, uh, control of any condition that is harming or causing damage to our kidney tissues is just that, to, to first to try to stop the, the forward progress of that condition and then try to manage the initial condition so it doesn't uh, continue to cause uh, different problems uh, with, with kidney and other organs. So. Yeah, um, and, and, and that being said means that somebody with CKD, not everybody with CKD will end up on dialysis, for sure. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, and we have about five more questions left. I know that we're a little bit over on time, but uh, thank you for sticking with us. Um, next, is constipation connected to CKD? That one I probably have to uh, research a little bit, but it can be. Uh, and I um, I haven't uh, read anything directly uh, connected to it, but I've heard there's some situations uh, because of all the functions that kidney do. And, and some of it uh, uh, may be related to the absorption of vitamin D that may stay in, in the intestinal tract. But, you know, don't want to go further with that, but we can definitely research and, and come back uh, with an answer to that. Uh, but uh, possibly. Yeah, possibly, but the, the way also you mentioned, it doesn't seem to be a common kind of effect of CKD uh, on your body. I mean, sometimes can be related with medication to medications that people take, depending on what you're taking. Um, but we, yeah, we don't we don't know much about that, and we could um, research more. <laughs> we'll get back to you next week. Uh, what happens if you don't remove a kidney stone? Will that affect your kidneys in any way? Oh, absolutely. Uh, depending on how uh, initially, uh, if the kidney stone is fairly small, maybe not so much. It may be able to be small enough to pass through all the the uh, uh, architecture and the, the connections that the kidney has with the bladder uh, and then kind of getting it out. But as time goes, the tendency is that as it progresses, it, it goes through um, um, a passageways that get smaller and smaller 
uh, for the, the stone to pass through and eventually get stuck. And, and it can cause uh, a lot of, uh, it can cause pain for one. It can also cause uh, the urine production um, to back up into the bladder. And then, you know, you get other complications. The bacteria that exist in our, normally in our organs can multiply because they're not able to uh, uh, be released. Uh, the, li the liquid in the urine that's formed. And so, uh, you know, it can kind of just uh, build up and complicate upon itself that it can cause a, a big issue. So, yeah, uh, those uh, little things that we talk about, symptoms related to kidney function, again, are important to, to really take notice of, uh, to make sure that every time you go, or have an opportunity to seek advice or a regular uh, physical checkups that you do mention. And, and make sure that uh, you're able to get a urinalysis. After all, a urinalysis, a simple check of your urine is part of the physical examination that we recommend every year. So baseline, uh, every time you go see uh, a physician or a healthcare provider, um, you can technically ask for, uh, for a checking of your urine uh, and especially, again, if you have any of the risk factors that Elena mentioned in terms of the possibility of, you know, uh, through genetics, through family ties, through maybe even uh, some uh, everyday life uh, um, things that you do in terms of your nutrition, your activity, so on and so forth, um, may put you at risk uh, for that silent uh, initiation of perhaps some kidney problems down the line. So, again, a urinalysis is always a, a good uh, to ask for as part of your yearly uh, checkup or whenever you I have a follow up question. Yeah. In a urine ana analysis, can you screen from kidney stones? Would that show um, if somebody may have a kidney stone that it's not aware of, let's say it's not to the point that produces pain and discomfort, but may be there? It can, uh, depending on the, what type of um, kidney stone it is. As we know, a kidney stone is formed by uh, a lot of the uh, electrolytes, the, the elements that are being uh, you know, eliminated through urine. And so sometimes those are in excess, circul in circ excess circulation in, in the blood. And as the blood is being uh, filtered by the urine, they can appear uh, in the urine sample that is being tested. So yeah, and that's important because not only you know for, for urine analysis, uh, you're looking at the color, you're looking at the components, especially things that shouldn't be uh, in, the, in the filtered uh, urine that comes out in terms of, uh, there are certain substances that when you start seeing like excess protein, as an example, that you know when you when those uh, when you start seeing excess amount of protein in the urine, then that kind of clues you in into knowing perhaps thinking that something is happening in the kidney that is not good. Uh, same thing with some of the elements, some of the electrolytes, uh, the potassium, the sodium, all that stuff. It's important uh, and it can be checked in a simple urine sample. And so that's why you know that's probably the simplest uh, exam, a test that someone can do uh, to determine uh, uh, their uh, urine kidney health uh, in terms of uh, what um, their current health condition is. Thank you, Franco. And thank you for the follow-up question, Elena. Uh, we have three more questions left. Um, Michael wants to know if an enlarged prostate create urine retention and pain in the kidneys, and if that can be addressed. This might that, be a doctor question. Yeah, um, exactly. And, 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 again, yeah, it can. Uh, and depending on how enlarged the, the prostate is, as we know that uh, we have a, a tube that goes through the prostate, the prostate surrounds it. And so depending on, on where and how large the prostate is, it could be compressing uh, and causing the urine uh, to not flow freely. Uh, so, but again, yes, definite question uh, and point of examination and, and investigation uh, for that individual to take care of uh, what is causing the enlarging uh, the prostate, because it could be simple age as it occurs in, in we know that it occurs in, in us males, uh, but it could be something else as well. Yeah, and I think it was on one of my uh, slides when I said what other things like lupus and can cause enlarged prostate can, can cause CKD, but I know it's not very common compared with other conditions, uh, but it can happen. Yeah, it can, it can lead to that. Okay. Elena, how many years from 3A to 3B? Oh, it depends. It depends. You know, some people progress faster than others. And some, again, with what you do, you can stop it. Um, and 
you know, can be years between even moving or not moving. And sometimes can be months of, of actually, I had a patient that had this progressive, uh, but in a way fast. Um, I think it's, it's based on, of course, each individual things that we might never know how to account for. We're all different, but, um, but it will matter, of course, uh, what's the reason why the CKD develops. Again, if it's unmanaged diabetes and you continue not controlling your blood sugar, not taking medication, not making lifestyle changes, your blood sugar gets higher than it should be, you know, that can actually have it progress faster versus somebody that makes changes, takes medication or works with the physician, maybe adding another agent and controlling better blood sugar at, at that point the damage may not um, happen or continue happening. So it's really, it's a big range depending on, on again, how well you manage um, the condition that leads to CKD. Okay. We have one more question here. Uh, can, a, can an EGFR of 36.2 be improved? Yes. And I could tell I had patients that from a 36, they maybe bump it to 40, 42. I think up to 10 points, I've seen increases in GFR just with, you know, better management, uh, diet modifications. I haven't seen more than that. Again, cannot be reversed the way Franco was saying you can go to the 90s or 100s anymore, but it can be improved a little bit. And the most important thing, because people feel like, well, if the kidneys are doing their job at 36% and you're not having all those complications and all those issues, is like the main important thing, what I want people to focus on is that let's do everything to stop it right there. You could live for the rest of your life with 36% of kidney function, but and you don't need to end up on dialysis if you're able to do everything you can to keep it there. You know, you might improve it a little bit, but not too much. So this is from my experience that I've seen those numbers increasing a little bit. Maybe Franco, you want to add? No, I just want to second what you just said. And, and you know, it goes back to the, the importance uh, and highlighting the, the, the importance uh, that we need to do in terms of ourselves as patients, in terms of individuals with a health condition, especially in the case of diabetes, high blood pressure. The key word is management and control. You know, being able to manage and control your sugar, your salt consumption, your uh, cholesterol as well, uh, the ABCs as we call them, uh, knowing that 75% uh, of kidney disease is caused by those conditions uh, uh, that are related, connected to salt, uh, sugar, and fat consumption in our daily lives. And so if we're able to manage uh, and put into play, uh, you know, everything that we have heard and we are told in terms of our daily living, I think that goes a, a, a lot long ways in preventing you know, further progression of that GFR of, of um, you know, progression of stage uh, of the particular stage that you're at with kidney failure. Obviously, when you get to, you know, stage four and stage five, it's pretty difficult to, to really uh, uh, assist in any way because you're almost at the end at that point in time. But uh, it's never too late. Uh, you can always start and improve your daily habits. And I think that's where we can all start uh, to, to begin our, our improvement in the health that we have. Thank you so much, Ilana and Franco. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't take up any more time of everyone here, but we will uh, send out a post-event email tonight uh, that, or, or by tomorrow, uh, that post-event email will have a survey and it will also include the link to today's recording. And of course, it will also include details about next week's class and if you have anything else to add, Franco and Ilana, please let our audience know. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And we, uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, a week from today. Yes, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Bye.